So the electron energy and its position are also complementary because the energy depends, depends on the velocity. Right? Kinetic energy of an object is one half mass times the velocity squared. So if we can know either the position or the velocity, then we could know either the position or the energy because the energy depends on the velocity. So the best we can do if we have an electron with a given energy is to describe where it is in terms of an orbital, a region of probability where the electron is likely to be found. And so if we go back to the, um, the story about Andrew when he was two, that's just kind of a rough sketch of the house. And Andrew is an orange dot, and so you know, kitchen, and then he's in his room, and he's using my bathroom, and then he's watching TV, and then he's out in the backyard, and he's over here, and sometimes he sleeps in his bed, but mostly he sleeps in my bed. This is when he was two. And then he's over there. He kept escaping from the house. I mean, we locked everything down and just, you know, there are children like that. And, you know, you hear these stories about, you know, the two-year-old found wandering in the tower district or something. Some children are challenging that way. Some parents are not keeping an eye on their kids, true, but it's not always the parents. I am really thankful no one reported me. Um... He is healthy and thriving and was never harmed. <laughs> but this is like a probability map for Andrew, right? I can't describe, I can't pinpoint exactly where he is, but I can tell you where he probably is. And so that's what an orbital is like. It's a, it's a volume where the electron probably is. Now, exactly where in that volume? No idea. Okay. Um, we are most concerned with the energies of electrons because those affect the properties of the atoms. Yeah. Is it possible for the electron to go out of the orbital? Yes, it is possible for the electron to be outside the orbital because the orbital is not a container. It's a region of probability. And if you want a region in which there's 100% probability, then you have to include the entire universe. So that's not very useful. So usually it'll be like 90% or something, but then there's a 10% a chance that the electron is not in there at all. You know, and the reason I like math is because one plus one equals two. And this sort of stuff just doesn't work that way. This is Schrodinger's equation. Um, Schrodinger's equation allows us to calculate the probability of finding an electron that has a particular amount of energy at a particular location in the atom. And um, Schrodinger's equation doesn't have a single solution. It has many solutions, and those are called wave functions. And these wave functions describe the wave-like nature of the electron. So if we plot the wave function squared that gives us a representation of an orbital. Now, that explanation, if you are really into physics and math, you might be like, oh, well, that's interesting. And I expect most of you to think, what are you talking about? So you don't have to understand that. It's really crazy math they do with super powerful computers, and they come up with these shapes. And personally, I don't care exactly how they did that. I'm just okay with it because that's what they're paid to do. So the calculations show us that the size, the shape, the orientation in space of these regions, these orbitals, depend on three integers that are in the wave function. And those are um, called quantum numbers. We need those integers in the equation because the energy of electrons is quantized. We know that. Electrons 
in an atom can only have particular energies. Well, we can know the energy, but then we can't know the position. The best we can do is this wave function. So these three integers are called quantum numbers. There's the principal quantum number, n, the angular momentum quantum number, l, and the magnetic quantum number, m sub l. There's a fourth one called the spin quantum number, m sub s. Um, that one pertains to particular um, electrons is more than quantizing energy. So the first number, the principal quantum number, n, this describes the overall size and energy of an orbital. In Bohr's model of the atom where we had the nucleus and then we had different orbits around the nucleus that an electron could be in, this value n says which orbit is the electron in. Is it in the first one, the second one? Is it the third orbital from the sun, right? N can be any integer that's one or greater. An integer is a whole number, a counting number, one, two, three, four, five, those sorts of numbers. If N is larger, then the electron has more energy and the orbital is larger in size. So for hydrogen, we can calculate the energy of an electron and we've got this equation. The energy of the electron in level n is equal to minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18th joules times 1 over n squared. So whatever n is, 1, 2, 3, etc., you stick it in there, you square it, and you do the math and you can figure out the energy of the electron. The energy is negative because the electron's energy is lowered by interacting with the nucleus. As n gets larger, the energy difference between the orbitals gets smaller. So here's a picture. So energy going up. So the first level, the first orbit in Bohr's model, n equals 1, the energy there is minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. In the second level, the energy is minus 5.45 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So this is less negative. So energy is getting larger. It's going closer to zero. Sorry about all the negatives. N equals 3, N equals 4. So as we go higher in N, the energy of the electron gets higher. Higher energy things are less stable. That's like raising raising a ball above the surface of the earth or raising a piano right from a lift on the seal of on the roof you know and it's you lift it an inch off the ground okay that's a little unstable but you got it at 20 feet up in the air it's like okay now this thing's really unstable right and just the littlest thing the rope breaks and boom right so the higher you go the less stable okay the difference between level 2 and level 1 is larger than the difference between 2 and 3. And as we go up, the differences get smaller and smaller. So for 5, 5 might be here. They're going to get closer and closer together. Okay? And these are negative numbers, so as the energy is getting higher, it's getting closer to zero. So yes. Yeah. And at some point, the electron would have left the atom. Okay. It would no longer be attracted to the nucleus. The, the energy is negative because by interacting with the nucleus, the electron is stabilized. It's, it's weird. Well, things, I think of it this way, things, things go roll down hills, right? And if you let a rock roll down through the surface of the ocean, would it keep rolling down under the ocean? Sure it would. If the, if the slope kept going down, we got a, we got a picture. Let's have a picture here. Um, so, so here's the bank. And here's the water. And we've got this rock. Is the rock going to stop when it gets here to zero altitude? No, it's going to keep going, and it's going to go below. 
This is zero altitude because we decided to d define it that way. It's going to keep rolling until it gets to the lowest possible, right? So if that helps you think about the negative business, if not, ignore it. So the second one tells us the shape of the orbital. And this, this number can have values from zero up to one less than n. And so we, we typically refer to these with letters. A bunch of reasons for that. But so what we call an S orbital is when L equals 0, a P orbital when L equals 1, D, L equals 2, F, L equals 3. These are the numbers that are in the wave function equation. These letters came about because of original descriptions of the lines that were given from um, atomic emission lamps, um, sharp, principal, diffuse, and fine to describe the kinds of lines. And so we've kept them for historical reasons. Um, we're not trying to be tricky by not using A, B, C, D. So what values of L are possible when N equals 3? L can be um, 0, 1, etc., up to 1 less than N. So if N is 3, then N minus 1 would be 2. So we'd have 0, 1, and 2. So that would be choice C. 0 is an S orbital, P is, and 1 is P, and 2 is D. The next one, the magnetic quantum number, gives the orientation of the orbital how the orbital is aligned in space relative to the other orbitals. And here we can have values that are negative. They can go from minus L to plus L, including zero. And the number of different M sub L values tells us how many orbitals there are with that particular shape. So if L equals two, then M sub L can go from minus L, minus 2, all the way up to plus L, which is plus 2, and is all the integers in between, including 0. I'm going to give you an analogy in a few minutes that hopefully will make all of this pull together a little bit, because I know this is just random sounding stuff. So what values of M sub L are possible for L equals 2? You know, that is just really dumb because the pretend you didn't see the previous slide. I didn't notice that yesterday. So M sub L goes from minus L to plus L. So if L is two, then we've got negative two up to positive two. We got negative one and zero and positive one. So that would be D, right? These parameters seem a bit random, but we deal with stuff like this in everyday life, right? Can you have the uh, 30th day of September? I mean, the 30th day of February. Yeah, 30 days has September, April, June, and November. After February is done, all the rest of 31. So February never has a 30th day. Why? Because the calendar is set up that way. Do we get all bent, of shape, bent out of shape about that? No, it's just how it is. We'll just get used to it. 
Is there a September 31st? No. It ends at September 30th. Why? Do we really need to know? No, we don't. We just get used to it. There's October 31st, right? So we recognize that there are possible dates and impossible dates, right? And so that's a little bit like these numbers. If the month is, is two, then the day cannot be 30. If the month is three, the day can be 30. If the month is anything but two, the day can be 30, right? But then only some of them have 31. Yeah, and then the, every fourth year, there's a 29th of February, just you know, to make it more interesting. The spin quantum number describes the spin of an electron. Electron spin is a fundamental property. All elements, all elements, all electrons have the same amount of spin, but the sign is different. Um, it's not really like spinning clockwise and counterclockwise, but we can think of it that way, it's good enough. My kids used to play with Beyblade tops, right? And some of them spin clockwise and some spin counterclockwise, right? And then you have battles with them. And Just like a year after I got rid of all the stuff from the first batch of kids, then the second batch of kids got into Beyblades and I had to buy all of it again. So that's why I never throw anything away. So here we say the spin is either plus one half or minus one half. Pardon me? That's the, the direction of the spin. Yeah, they all have the same amount of spin, but they spin different directions. So we can describe an or orbital using three quantum numbers. Um, each orbital is going to have its own set of three quantum numbers. So if we say n equals 1, l equals 0, and m sub l equals 0, this describes what we refer to as a 1s orbital. This is in the first principal energy level. l equals 0 means it's an s orbital. M sub L gives the orientation of the S orbital, but because there's only one, there's not another orientation. If the orbitals are in this, have the same value of N, we, we say they're in the same principal level or principal shell, and then orbitals with the same values of N and L are said to be in the same sublevel or subshell. Okay, so this is a lot like a hotel, a very, very weird hotel. Here's a picture. So I think this would be, um, I'm going to make it purple because that's just kind of a funny color. But this would be like, you know, one of those really weird hotels you see in Las Vegas. But this is like the inverted pyramid. You wouldn't want this in California because an earthquake would just knock it right over. So the, the principal levels here are like the floors of the hotel. So there's a first floor and a second floor and a third floor. And the higher you go up in the floor, the higher you are above the ground, I guess the more damage would happen if you fell out the window. But higher in energy, right? On each floor, you have different rooms. Those rooms are the sublevels. On the first floor, there's one sublevel, one room. On the second floor, there's two rooms. On the third floor, there's three rooms. On the fourth floor, there's four rooms. The first room next to the elevator is the S room, or L equals zero. And next is L equals one, the P room. And past that is L equals two, the D room. And on the fourth floor, you've got the S, P, D, and then you have an F room, where L equals three. It's a little easier to understand the, this pattern here now, because we can imagine this sort of an order, right? All of the S rooms have one bed in them. All of the P rooms have three beds. All the D rooms have five beds, and the F rooms have seven beds. Each bed can hold two people. So the sublevel is that quantum number L. <clears throat> M sub L, that magnetic number, 
is which of the beds in this room are we talking about? Now, it's actually talking about orientation in three-dimensional space. Is it vertical? Is it horizontal relative to the other ones, etc.? But we could say, well, this is beds closest to the door, you know, and instead of calling them one, two, three, we start, you know, negative one, zero, and plus one. And over here, we've got five beds. So the electrons, let's see if I can do a better job of this. I don't know if you can tell that's supposed to be a bed. Kind of looks like a bed. We don't need that part of the way. Each bed can hold two people. Each orbital can hold two electrons. But electrons have negative charges, and so two negatively charged things don't like to be together. The only way that two electrons can be together in an orbital if they, is if they are spin paired. One has up spin and one has down. One has positive and one has negative spin. They still have negative charges, but they can pair up like this. And so I think of spin as how are you sleeping in the bed? Are you sleeping right side up in the bed like most normal people do? <laughs> well, my children is pretty much random and you, they might not even be in the bed. Sometimes they just choose to sleep on the floor or on the pile of laundry. <laughs> I think of the electrons as being like guys, like maybe high school, college age guys. And so you imagine like the football team going to this far, far away game and so they have to stay in a hotel. And you got four guys assigned to this hotel room and there's two double beds. What happens? There's some sort of fight for dominance as to who gets a bed and the other two guys sleep on the floor, right? You can't do this in this hotel because the floor is lava. <laughs> so you have to sleep in the bed. So what are they going to do? This next guy is going to sleep upside down. Because we don't want any possible, you know, just, yeah, you understand. So this one is plus one half, and this one is minus one half, OK? So in each of these rooms, we can have different numbers of electrons. So in an S room, we could have up to two electrons staying there. In a P room, we could have six electrons. In a D room, we could have 10 electrons, OK? And so now when we think about, well, what are the possible values of, of L when N equals 2? L is how many rooms are there on the floor? Well, on the second floor, there's two rooms. And so there's L equals 0 and L equals 1. Up here on N equals 3 floor, we can have three rooms, and so there's three of these. Over here in the D room, L equals 2, and so the orbitals are from minus L up to plus L, including 0. We'll talk more about this later. The, yeah, L does not equal the floor. In fact, L cannot be the same as the floor number. It's the number, it's the number of rooms on the floor, but because it starts at zero, it's never the same. Yeah, so up here on the third floor, um, there are three rooms, but this is zero, one, and two. No, the, the orientation of the orbital is unrelated to the spin of the electrons. Um, you can't, just like in a hotel room, you can't have two beds occupying the same space, right? They, they have to be like next to each other or across the room or something. And so we'll see the shapes of these orbitals. They're all around the nucleus, but they can't be superimposed on top of each other. And so we have to have different regions, and so there's different orientations. 
another interesting thing is um, so if an if an atom has only two electrons, do these orbitals exist? Well, think about the hotel. If there's no one staying on the third floor, do those rooms cease to exist? No, they're still there. They're just empty. So all of these orbitals are possible places for an electron to be, even if there's no electron in them. Um, list the quantum numbers associated with all of the 5D orbitals and how many of those exist. Well, the quantum numbers, we've got N, and we've got L, and we've got M sub L. So I'm going to do this as a table, maybe different than I did yesterday. So a 5D orbital, what does that 5 tell me? That's N. So N is going to be 5. And it's a 5D orbital. And we've got S, P, D and F, <coughs> L equals 0, 1, 2, and 3. So if, if it's a D orbital, then what's L? It's 2. So L is 2. And then what's M sub L? It could be several different things, right? It could be minus 2 or minus one, or zero, or plus one, or plus two. Yeah, I always start with the negative L up to positive L. It doesn't really matter, no. If I, you know, if you were asked, well, what are the possible values? You could say zero, negative two, plus one, minus one, plus two. What are the first three letters of the alphabet? B, A, and C. My kids, I don't know where they get this. Well, how many people were there? Well, there were four or three. You're supposed to say the small one first and then the big one. Everybody does it except my kids. There were four or three. It's just, it's mentally jarring because you hear four or and I'm expecting five. And it's going the wrong way. So, so this is the principal level. This is telling us what floor of the hotel. This is telling us which room. And then what's not specified here is which of the five beds in that room is this person staying in. And so for these five beds in that room, we have five separate designations. They all are five, two, and then a different number. So five two negative two five two negative one five two zero five two plus one five two plus two. So the M sub L is which bed? Yes. M sub L is which bed are we talking about? And then the fourth quantum number is that particular electron. Are they sleeping right side up or upside down? We just assume right side up first, and then upside down if necessary. That works with my hotel analogy also. It's very convenient. So we have a set of numbers that are unique for each orbital. 5, 2, and negative 2. That combination describes one orbital, one bed that electrons could be sleeping in. It's a little bit like a social security number or a VIN number on a car and different parts of the VIN number tell you different pieces of information. It might tell you the month that it was made and the year and the plant and the original color and all this different stuff is all in the VIN number, right? So these are like that. Will we ever get a letter besides SPD? No. We'll never get a letter besides SPD and F. Probably in theory, yeah. Because if n can be any integer greater than one, then yeah, like how far could they go, yeah. right? Yeah. So the one that's on the worksheet, 
Yeah, so G would come after F. Because then they went back to the alphabet. Okay, so we can just follow the alphabet. So each set of quantum numbers here specifies an orbital, but there's a mistake. So each of these combinations has one number that doesn't work with the other numbers. We're supposed to figure out what it is. So for the first one, n equals 3. Well, is that a possible value for 3? Sure it is. If n is 3, can l be 3? No. l could be 0, 1, or 2, but it can't be 3. So that's wrong. Um, so we've got two, three possibilities here. We could put 0, 1, or 2, but then we have to pick something that's going to work with the last number as well. So if m sub l is plus 2, what's the only l that's going to work with that? 2, right? Because m sub l can be from minus l up to plus l, and so if l was 0 or 1, this wouldn't be possible. So it should be 2. Here n equals 2, can l equal 1? Mm -hmm. If l is 1, can m sub l equal minus 2? No. What are the possible values there? 0, 1, and negative 1. Either any of the three there would work with the other two. Yes? Um, no, we, we, we can't just assume that L equals N minus 1 because it could be N minus 2 or N minus 3. It's, it, it's just, that's the maximum it could be. Here I'm choosing 2 because it's the only one that will work with the given M sub L. If I, if I don't have a 2 here, then I'm going to have to change that one as well. And the stipulation here is that there's one number that's not right. Um, here, L equals 1. Okay, we could have L, I'm sorry, N equals 1. Then can L equal 1? No. L has to be 0. So if L is 0, can M sub L be 0? Yes, it has to be. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. We'll get to that in the next chapter, I think it is. Okay. Now we can explain atomic spectroscopy. So in an atomic spectrum, like the, the lamps we had in here on Tuesday, um, they, the light given off is only particular wavelengths. And if you look at it through a prism, it separates it. And you see there's individual lines. It's not a whole rainbow of color. Each of those wavelengths corresponds to an electron transition between two orbitals. So when an atom absorbs energy, an electron goes from a lower energy orbital up to a higher energy orbital. What do I like to refer to energy as in real life? Money, right? So in the hotel, the lower rooms like that 1S room, that's the cheapest room to stay in. If you go up to the 3D room, that's a lot more expensive. So electrons are cheap, like most humans, and they're going to stay in the cheapest rooms. So here, the atom absorbs energy. There's like this, the electron gets a bunch of energy, gets a bunch of money, maybe because this is in Vegas, right? He won at the slot machines or something. And he's like, oh, cool, I've got all this cash. I'm going to stay in the fancy penthouse room, right? So he goes up there, but he can't sustain that. It's an excited state, it's unstable, and eventually he's going to have to come back down. He might come back down in several steps, or in one giant step, anything is possible. When they come back down, they're losing energy, and that energy is released as light. And we can measure the wavelength of the light and calculate its energy, and the energy of the light corresponds to the difference in the levels that it went from to whatever that didn't go down picture. So here again, energy diagram, we've got energy going up here. And so here we had an electron in the, on the first floor, and it got some energy and went up to the third floor, up to the third principal level. Okay, that's an excited state, it's not stable. 
and at some point it's going to go back down. Now here it's just going back down to the second level and then later it'll go back down to the first level. When it goes from the third level to the second level, it releases that energy as light and the light energy corresponds to the difference in energy between these two levels. I think of the excited, you know, I have a lot of experience with junior high, I mean, teenage boys. And so teenage boys, their normal ground state is horizontal in, on beds or couches or something. They just, you know, real big on sleeping, right? But they do get up and do stuff. They get up and they go to f football practice and weights early in the morning. And, and they get up and they do stuff. That's the excited state, but they, don't, they can't maintain that all the time. And so then they come back and they crash. Right? This is what happens with the electrons. In order to go to a higher state, the energy has to, I mean, the electron has to get just the right amount of energy. Just like riding a bus where you need exact change. If the fare is 75 cents and you say, well, here's a dollar. And they're like, nope, it's got to be exact change. It's got to be exactly 75 cents. And you're like, Who doesn't want extra money? But they say, no, and you can't ride the bus. You have to get exactly the right amount of energy for the electron to go up to that level. And then when it falls back down, it releases that back out. Because we can't have energy being created or destroyed in this process. So for hydrogen, we can predict the lines in the emission spectrum by calculating the difference in energy between different states. And the Bohr model and the quantum mechanical model both predict these lines very well for hydrogen, a one electron system. The Bohr model only works for the one electron system, and thankfully quantum mechanics works for all the others as well. So the energy of the photon that's released equals the difference in energy between the two levels. So delta E is the energy of the final state minus the energy of the initial state. So if we're going from, let's just make that picture again. So we had an electron that was excited and it was up here and now it's gonna go back down here and it's gonna release energy. The energy that's released here is the difference between the final and the initial. The final energy is the energy of this state and the initial is the energy of that one. We can calculate those for hydrogen. Minus 2.18 times to the minus 18th joules times one over N squared. N is the principal energy level. So for this one, initial would be three and the final would be two. And so we'd stick those numbers in there. This is the final energy, this is the initial energy. Well, they both have the same term in them, in them so that we can factor that out and say that the change in energy is minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18th joules times one over n final squared minus one over n initial squared. That's the change in energy. So we can talk about we can talk about the atoms energy or the photons energy and those are going to be opposite in sign. And so if we're coming from 3 to 2 the photon that's released is going to have a positive energy and the elect the, the atoms going to experience a decrease in energy so its delta will be delta E will be negative. If I talk about going the other way, like going from 1 to 3, there, the photon coming in is losing its energy, and so the change in energy for the atom is positive. Okay, so when, it, when it's moving up, are we counting how many levels are dropping down, or are we actually counting the levels of We're just looking at the final and the initial. Right, so for this one, we're going um, n equals 1 to n equals 3. 
And this one up here is n equals 3 to n equals 2. It doesn't matter what's in between. It's just the final and the initial. And if we're wanting the wavelength, after we calculate the energy, the wavelength is equal to hc over the energy. That's just a rearrangement of E equals hc over lambda. So here we can look at transitions in hydrogen. So here's the lowest um, energy level. And so we can um, excite an electron to a higher level. If we excite the electron to n equals infinity, we have ejected the electron from the atom. It's left the building. Right? And so coming back from an excited state, if we're going from 5 to 1, or 4 to 1, or 3 to 1, or 2 to 1, those are all large energy changes. High energy, and so the light that's given off is high energy. It's actually in the ultraviolet spec region, and we can't see it with our eyes. Over here, these from 5 to 3 and 4 to 3, these are very small energy changes, and so those fall in the infrared region. The ones we can see are from 5 and 4 and 3 down to 2. And it's just because the energy change there happens to correspond to wavelengths within the visible region. Which transition emits light with the shortest wavelength? We don't have to calculate anything, but we have to think about calculations. So short wavelength yeah so the question is would it would it be the biggest energy change or the smallest energy change right so how do we remember well we can think about the equation e equals hc over lambda if lambda is big then energy is small if lambda is small then energy is big so we're looking for the biggest energy the highest energy change large energy change or maybe we don't remember the equation we can look at our bad drawing of waves which one of those looks more energetic the one on the bottom so this one's high energy and this one's low energy. Which one has the shorter wavelength? The one on the bottom. So that's lambda. So short wavelength goes with high energy. OK, so we've identified that we need the one with the largest change in energy. And the way those levels go is as you go higher and higher, they get closer and closer together. So 3 to 2, 4 to 3, or 5 to 4, which is going to be a bigger change? The 3 to 2. Oops, I can't circle up there. Wrong part of the screen. Because this, this is 3 to 2, and 4 to 3, and 5 to 4. As you go up, they get closer and closer together. That's a possible test question right there. Determine the wavelength of the light absorbed when an electron in a hydrogen atom makes a transition from an orbital in which n equals 2 to an orbital in which n equals 7. So the initial n is 2. That's where it's starting. And the final n is 7. This is in hydrogen. We can only do these calculations for hydrogen. 
the change in energy is equal to minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules times 1 over an F squared minus 1 over an I squared. So the final is 7. So I've got 7 squared, and the initial was 2, so I've got 1 over 2 squared. The hard part here is putting this into your calculator, so make sure you try it. What I'm going to do on my TI-36X Pro is I'm going to say minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus EE minus 18 times, and then I'm going to open the parentheses, 1 divided by 7 squared minus 1 divided by 2 squared, close the parentheses and press equals. So the change in energy is equal to 5.01 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. Here we're looking at the wavelength of light that's absorbed. Okay, the the wavelength always has to be a positive number. But the wavelength of light is equal to Hc over the energy, where H and C are constants. And then we put energy in underneath. And the joules cancel and the seconds cancel, and we're going to get a wavelength in meters. Three point zero zero times ten to the eighth is the speed of light. It's a constant. So I'm getting 3.97 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, which you could convert to nanometers, and that's going to be 397 nanometers. So you can calculate the energy of the transition, and from the energy you can calculate the wavelength. If you're looking at the wavelength of light, you can calculate the energy of that light, and then you can calculate the energy change that that represents.